Good evening uh, to uh, Professor Ono, our speaker today. Uh, good afternoon uh, to friends uh, from Asia, India, and uh, maybe good morning uh, to our colleagues, uh, friends from Europe and other places. I'm really privileged and very, very happy and excited today to welcome to this 70th, the special seminar uh, by Professor Hideo Ono. It's a dream come true to have him uh, on our seminar program. Uh, so I think he really does not need any formal introduction to our Spintronics magnetism community. But nevertheless, uh, for the benefit of some young students, I, I guess they are here. Uh, and we are having a, actually a very large audience today. That's really nice. Uh, so first of all, uh, on behalf of my team, uh, my co-convenor, Dr. Brajbhushan Singh, other WTS team members like Puspendra, Sakti, Ajar, and others, I welcome you all to this uh, 70th special seminar in uh, webinar series on screen products. Uh, thank you uh, to all for joining uh, and supporting us throughout the seminar programs. And many, many thanks to speakers like Professor Ono, who very kindly always come forward and agree to our, in, uh, to our invitations to give talks. So as uh, I said uh, very briefly, maybe I will mention about his academic uh, profile. Uh, or obviously, I think you know, all of us know about it. So, Professor Hideo Ono received his PhD from the University of Tokyo in 1982. Then he had joined the Hokkaido University from 1982 and was a visiting scientist at the IBM DJ Watson Research Center from 1988 to 1990. He was appointed as a professor at Tohoku University in 1994, and uh, he became its president. Uh, now he's working as a president of Tohoku University since 2018. His main interest has been on spintronics and semiconductor science and technology and made seminar contributions to the field, including the first electrical manipulation of magnetism. An introduction of today's de facto standard non-volatile magnetic memory structure. He has received the IBM Japan Science Award, the IUPAP Magnetism Prize, the Japan Academy Prize, the Tohoku University Presidential Prize for Research Ex Excellence, the 2005 Agilent Technology Europhysics Prize, the IEEE Magnetic Society Distinguished Lecturer for uh, 2009, uh, the Thomson Reuters Citation Laureate, the JACP Outstanding Achievement Award, the IEEE David Sunup Award, the JSAP Compound Semiconductor Electronics Achievement Award, the Leo Esaki Prize, DPS Paper Award, the CNC Prize, the next commendation for science and technology, the IACS Waker Award and JSAP Paper Award. He is an honorary professor uh, of the Institute of Semiconductors, Chinese Academy of Sciences since uh, 2006. He is a fellow of the Institute of Physics, the Japan Society of Applied Physics, the American Physical Society and the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. So again, I'm very delighted uh, to welcome Professor Ono to this uh, seminar. Uh, there are probably new audience. So I just want to mention that during the lecture, we don't take any questions. If you have any questions, you can write in the chat window or just raise your hand. At the end of the lecture, we will have plenty of time to interact uh, with the Professor Ono. So with this brief note, now I basically hand over everything to Professor Ono. You may kindly start your lecture. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Bedanta, and uh, I'm very much uh, pleased and uh, it's great, my great joy uh, to be here to talk to you uh, today on uh, the subject that I have. on other campuses as well as uh, uh, in the United States and uh, uh, other places. So uh, I would like to thank them all for, uh, for what we have done together. Okay, um, because I am a president of uh, uh, Tohoku University, uh, I, will, uh, I, I do have to show you a few slides uh, that uh, to introduce you to uh, my university, if I can advance my slide here. Sorry, um, I have a little bit, I'm 
I'm here. Oh, here we go. Uh, so Tohoku University is the third oldest national university in Japan, founded in 1907. And uh, it's located uh, 300 kilometers north of Tokyo. Uh, and uh, the city is called, uh, uh, let's see, I need to show this. And I have, I would like to have a pointer. Um, the city is called Sendai. And the Tohoku it means the northeast region of Japan. So this is basically the region. And uh, our profile uh, look like this uh, in terms of rankings. Uh, these are the current rankings of uh, our university. And we are currently building, uh, uh, well, Japanese government is building a, a, a new synchrotron-like source in, in, on our campus, and that will be operational in 2023. So I would like you to welcome, uh, I would like to welcome you uh, to, come and use this facility uh, uh, th that will bring us a, a new a dimension to material science and also uh, uh, many other disciplines. Okay, so uh, basically uh, this is what I would like to talk today, uh, magnetic tunnel junction uh, uh, and, and scaling. Uh, this, is, uh, this basically means that how small you can make those magnetic tunnel junction. And, uh, I would like to also answer, can you do something else? Uh, can you do more? So basically we have non-volatile memories uh, of all kinds, like a non-flash memory that we use in cell phones or smartphones and uh, resistance, resistant uh, random access memory and phase change. And uh, this is our magnetic tunnel junction. So uh, magnetic tunnel junction or spintronic based non-volatile memory device uh, is fast and it has, uh, you know, we can rewrite a number of times, uh, 10 to 15 or more. And uh, the voltage that it operates is low. And this is actually very important because here, uh, other, you know, non volatile memories, you have to ha increase uh, the source voltage, which is usually 1.2 volt, to uh, these 18 or 2 or 3 volts. So this means that we do not need any additional uh, circuitry to uh, operate this magnetic tunnel junction. So uh, that's the reason why we are working on and we are trying to demonstrate and we have already demonstrated uh, that uh, this will uh, bring us a new dimension to uh, the landscape of uh, electronics or ICT. So those of you, I, I believe many of you already know what magnetic tunnel junction is, but uh, because I was asked to uh, make this, uh, uh, my talk more in, introductory in, in a sense for young uh, and uh, newcom newcomers uh, to the field. So I, I will just uh, tell you what magnetic tunnel junction is. Uh, although I'm very sure that many of you already know. We have two ferromagnets, uh, this, in this case, green and purple, separated by a very thin tunnel barrier. And so this is uh, the reason why we call it magnetic tunnel junction. And the ferromagnet, uh, one of the ferromagnet is made in such a way that it's not easy to change its magnetization direction, NS. But the other one we change, uh, uh, we use to record a zero or one because the resistance of this tunnel junction changes with uh, 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 the, the relative orientation of uh, the ferromagnets. And uh, we have, uh, I, although I will not go into the details of uh, a switching scheme, uh, we, we have a threshold current uh, above which uh, we can change the state to uh, uh, parallel or anti-parallel depending on the direction of current. So, uh, Initially, we had uh, a number of uh, challenges, um, and uh, one is a large resistance change that, uh, that is required for applications. So initially, it was very small, so we had to make it large. And uh, I will explain to you briefly why we needed perpendicular easy access for efficient switching. And uh, the, this is another uh, topic that I will go in, into after explaining uh, these uh, two points. So uh, the, the resistance change is there because uh, we have, uh, the, well, because this tunneling uh, process 
uh, you have, you know, spin direction is conserved. So in this parallel scheme, uh, we have this large number of uh, reservoir uh, of ups. Well, in this particular case, uh, we have a large number of uh, up spin electrons uh, 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 being ton being uh, tunneled and transported to the other side. But in this antiparallel case, uh, we have small number of uh, up spins going to uh, a large number of uh, density of states, which basically means that this is this is high uh, resistance state, and this is low resistance state, and what which is easy to understand when you uh, think about an extreme case of half metal. In this case, we have a finite resistance, and here is infinite resistance, and. Uh, in terms of uh, re resistance change, resistance change divided by the low resistance uh, can be ex uh, expressed by a spin polarization of the material like this. So initially, uh, when we used uh, aluminum oxide amorphous barrier, uh, the first two dots uh, are from uh, Tohoku University and MIT, uh, the resistance change was small. In our definition, 100% uh, means if your base resistance is one kilo ohm, uh, we can change it to two kilo ohms. Uh, and that's uh, our definition of 100%. And uh, many people and many groups worked on it and try, uh, made it to uh, almost 70%. But here, for application point of view, we would like to make it to 200 or, or more. Uh, well, the 600 is probably too much and it's not a good too high a resistance change is not good for application but this is a range what we, we would like to see but if you go through the polarization of materials like nickel iron or cobalt and alloy of them uh, this po spin polarization is a, approximately 50 percent at most and that means that uh, we can only get 50% of, uh, sorry, 70% of uh, resistance change. And that's what uh, people were observing back in 2004. Well, uh, uh, two groups came up with a solution, theoretically at least. And that was, uh, that is shown here. This is iron uh, band structure, and this is your Fermi energy. And if you only look at the, these, these delta one bands, uh, these are uh, uh, red and blue, depending on the spin polarization. So basically, if you only look at the delta one band, uh, iron is half metal. But, uh, but you have other states, other symmetry states. So uh, if you take into account other symmetry states, the spin polarization uh, becomes approximately 50%. But once you uh, make it into this structure, uh, iron or cobalt uh, crystal with MgO crystal one, uh, zero, zero, 001 orientation, another crystal cobalt or iron, then the tunnel, tunneling ratio, uh, decay rate is such that uh, when you have a few atomic layers of thick uh, magnesium oxide, uh, only delta one reaches because uh, you know this is a logarithmic scale, only delta one state reaches it, the other side, and uh, other uh, symmetry like delta five or delta two will not reach uh, the other side. Basically, meaning that the combination of uh, this uh, crystalline iron with MgO zero zero one structure effectively makes iron uh, half metal uh, because uh, because. Uh, uh, because we only see these uh, two uh, red and blue states. I will not go into the details of why this is so, but uh, you know, these, when you do a very simple, a straightforward calculation, uh, well, uh, then you, you, you can show that these decay rates are different in, dif in different bands because those, those uh, bands see different a tunnel barrier. So um, this was proposed and uh, demonstrated theoretically by Bill Butler back in uh, 2001, if I remember correctly. 
and, and yes, and George Madden and uh, Mirsky yeah, back uh, almost uh, at the same time uh, in US and UK. So uh, experimentalists took it uh, very seriously and tried to make it, uh, try to see if uh, it is indeed true. Uh, and uh, and uh, this uh, is the result. Uh, let's see if I can. Okay. So initially, uh, we did not know how to make this good crystalline structure, but later on, we show uh, many uh, groups, including us, show that cobalt ion boron MGO combination is the best and uh, we can make it up to 600%. For applications, this is too high, uh, but, uh, but so uh, the small tunnel mag magnet resistance was overcome by utilizing crystalline and MGO, uh, crystalline cobalt ion bar boron uh, MGO structure. Uh, well, uh, I would also like to note that uh, this structure can be first deposited by, uh, by uh, sputtering uh, in, in an amorphous structure, uh, cobalt ion boron, uh, we can make it amorphous. And on amorphous, we can uh, deposit uh, MGO with highly 001 oriented and, and another amorphous uh, layer on, on top. And later we anneal the structure to make the entire structure crystalline. So uh, we don't have to worry about uh, starting from crystalline structure. So that's another very big advantage for application. Okay, uh, the next slide, I would like to very briefly explain to you why we wanted to have a perpendicular easy axis. Uh, this is threshold current. I will not go into the details of uh, the origin, why I can write threshold current in this way, but this is also a barrier height. So intuitively, you can understand that the, the barrier height that separates uh, the two uh, states, uh, if it's high, you, it, it, you will have to spend more uh, current to switch the state from here to here. So uh, when you look at the expression, the, the threshold current has this uh, form very similar to uh, the energy barrier that you have here. The only difference here is that in, in in-plane case, the barrier that protect your state from uh, accidentally flipping to the other side uh, by, uh, by thermal fluctuation is this yellow state, which is uh, uh, you know, uh, smaller in terms of energy. But in terms of uh, switching, uh, you have to overcome this red state, uh, red state. Uh, because you have to process this uh, blue magnetization into the other direction by current. So uh, this uh, asymmetry of uh, threshold current uh, uh, and the energy uh, that protects your state from uh, thermal fluctuation is the reason why your switching current is uh, not efficient in in-plane case. Uh, in many cases, this is red red barrier is much, much greater than the yellow barrier here. So uh, we wanted to make uh, a perpendicular easy axis. In this case, sorry about this red uh, bar, uh, but basically the, in this case, the energy that you need to overcome uh, uh, by switching uh, current is the same as the energy barrier that you protect, uh, that, uh, that protect your state from flipping. So uh, everyone wanted to make it perpendicular. And this is uh, the, you don't have to read this. Uh, you know, this is just to show uh, how, what sort of uh, struggle uh, people, including us, uh, were having uh, at the time. So these, this is in plane and these are perpendicular easy axis, magnetic tunnel junction. And many people used very different materials because usually what, uh, if you only use cobalt ion boron MGO, it uh, brings you uh, in-plane case and uh, in-plane uh, easy access. But, so you have to rely on crystalline anisotropy 
or many uh, or other anisotropy to make it perpendicular to the plane. But you can easily see that this is a tunnel like the resistance. Many people, in this case, four groups reported tunnel magnetic resistance, but no switching. And uh, those people who were able to show the switching, uh, very small or no uh, resistance change. So clearly, we were, we were having uh, a big problem here. And uh, we, did, we were uh, systematically looked into the thickness dependence of, uh, of this structure, cobalt ion boron, uh, MGO. So this is a thick part, and this is a thin part. If you make cobalt ion boron too thin, it becomes super paramagnetic. Uh, this is as deposited, and this is annealed. Uh, and if you make it thick, uh, as you can easily imagine, the magnetization lies in plane. But we actually found out that in this uh, intermediate uh, region, uh, we still can have a very solid magnetization, unlike super paramagnetic uh, mag uh, magnetic behavior. And also, it becomes uh, perpendicular to the plane. So, Although we looked into many different material system, uh, this, the thing that we, want, we needed to do in this case is to make uh, our very familiar cobalt ion boron rather thin. And that's all we, we, we needed to do. So that's, uh, that's something that we found out uh, sometime late, later in two, 2010. And we immediately made it to uh, a device structure because we had a process running. So this is 40 nanometers. And at the time, uh, these numbers, I will not go into the details, but uh, were, were really good. And also uh, we can make it make the barrier height high. Uh, we can switch it uh, with current at relatively low current. And also the resistance change is relatively high. And also annealing uh, capability is above uh, later people are showing for beyond 400 degrees C, which is also important for integration purposes. So basically what we did was we made just these cobalt ion boron layers thin enough uh, because uh, there is an interface perpendicular anisotropy, uh, which we can make it to uh, work once we make uh, those layers thin enough to make the volume small enough. So this is a bulk anisotropy, shape anisotropy, which we can minimize by making the thickness thin, and, but keeping this interface perpendicular anisotropy uh, intact. Well, the reason why we have interface anisotropy perpendicular to the plane is shown here, but uh, for the interest of time, I will skip this part uh, and uh, and I, I will also very briefly mention uh, why we uh, were looking into such a very thin cobalt ion boron. Uh, we, we were working on electric field control of magnets and we initially used indium manganese arsenide or gallium manganese arsenide, these are ferromagnetic semiconductors. And after showing uh, this uh, successful electric field control of magnets, uh, people, including ourselves, wanted to see the same effect in uh, metals at room temperature. But the uh, electric field that uh, we can apply is limited. So the, the, the part that we are seeing uh, after applying electric field is very, uh, uh, is limited to the very surface. And we don't want it to see the bulk part because uh, we cannot change uh, the bulk property by electric field. And that's the reason why we wanted to make the sample very, very thin and ended up uh, by looking into those changes systematically, ended up uh, uh, showing the world that uh, we can uh, use good old cobalt ion boron MGO to make a very good uh, perpendicular easy axis magnetic tunnel junction, which is actually pe uh, people are using today. So what uh, brings this uh, magnetic memory or uh, magnetic tunnel junction to us is uh, a very profound in a sense, because the way we do uh, information processing is just like uh, this slide, uh, keeping all the 
uh, lights on. And also we are not uh, working on the old rooms here. We have to do this sort of uh, information processing because the current working memories are volatile. So we cannot keep, we cannot turn off all the memories because we lose the content of those memories. So there are two working memories, uh, DRAM, SRAM, both are volatile, but, uh, but and uh, when we keep these um, memories on, uh, it, pro it actually uh, consumes a lot of energy, uh, standby energy, because we are using a, a huge amount of those working memories. So what we would like to do is to turn off those memories that we are not uh, using and turn on it uh, immediately uh, when we need it. it. And uh, that uh, it cannot be provided by a flash memory or other types of memories, but uh, uh, only by uh, magnetic tonal junction, if I may say. And uh, we did uh, a demonstration. Uh, again, you don't have to uh, go into the details, but this is prototyped uh, on our campus but using 300 millimeter wafers, at least the magnetic tunnel junction part. And many uh, sorts of uh, in integrated circuits, we, we have been able to show that the power consumption uh, mostly uh, can be 100% less, or, or we can reduce it 97%, uh, 97%, 98%. So that's a very good news because uh, we can build a processor. Here's a Spintronics based uh, non volatile microcomputer with, with reasonable uh, uh, you know, frequency, which is uh, basically the, it shows how much um, information you can process per, per, per second. And this shows that uh, there are energy uh, that you can harvest from environment like uh, light uh, you, you using solar cells you at outdoor uh, outdoor you can get 100 milliwatt per square centimeter but indoor it's, it becomes down to 100 microwatt and human body is a heat difference uh, we can produce uh, 60 microwatt per square centimeter basically your sum uh, can uh, produce uh, this 60 microwatt so basically below this uh, 100 microwatt uh, threshold, if we can make our processor and everything works under this, then we do not have to worry about the battery anymore. So, and that's good for internet of things because we can forget about the battery, we can forget about replacing the battery and it produces uh, energy from environment. And uh, I think we got uh, this, uh, uh, the good news is here is that we can get reasonably high performance microcomputer below this 100 microwatt uh, threshold. And you might think that this is a uh, sort of uh, a futuristic thing, but it's, it's not. Uh, Spintronics magnetic random access memory or magnetic resistive random access memory using magnetic tunnel junction is here. You can actually buy uh, one of uh, the smartwatches and uh, that uh, watch use, utilizes GPS receiver designed by Sony, per, uh, manufactured by Samsung. And uh, this smartwatch itself is uh, Huawei uh, GT2. And they adv advertise that uh, the once, once you charge it, you can use it two weeks, uh, partly at least, uh, thanks to uh, this uh, power saving capability of uh, magnetic random access memory. So you can actually buy those things. Okay, so let me uh, move on to my second topic, which is still on magnetic tunnel junction, a uh, scaling. So how, how far we can make those uh, junction, uh, you know, how, how, how small we can make those junctions. Remember that uh, there is a barrier and this barrier depends on uh, volume and also uh, the cross section of our junction. So if we make those junctions small, uh, the barrier becomes small and small, but we, we are working, we are living in the room temperature, so we, we cannot change this KBT. So eventually, uh, we will not be able to keep the information because of this thermal fluctuation, and that is shown on this slide. 
So when we reduce the junction diameter, the energy barrier measured by KVT uh, reduces from below 30 nanometer down, down to uh, 10. Well, you might think that this is not a big change, but uh, well, this actually goes uh, into the exponential. So uh, 80 uh, or 100, basically the time constant is beyond the universe's life. Uh, but if you go to, down to 20, then it, uh, it makes uh, the, the transition time or retention time, uh, well, same thing, uh, about millisecond. So there's a quite big difference and we would like to keep this number be beyond 80 for uh, non-volatile applications. But here it appears that uh, we, when we reduce the volume, uh, it, it comes, this energy barrier comes down uh, uh, inevitably because the energy barrier is proportional to volume. And if you take into account the interface anisotropy, uh, the area or, or cross section of the junction. But, but uh, you can invent a new scheme uh, yourself because you already have uh, 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 enough knowledge to invent or overcome this uh, dilemma of a small junction. It's, it's uh, basically what you need to do is to make your device uh, look like this. This is a bar magnet. And uh, if you make your bar magnet this way, this, this is shape anisotropy basically. And uh, if you make your bar magnet uh, perpendicular, then this shape anisotropy, which used to be against uh, the perpendicular uh, easy axis, is now working together with your interface anisotropy. So both are perpendicular. So this has to be explored, we, we believe. And we went into, uh, first we did some calculation. Uh, this is uh, delta, which is energy barrier measured by uh, KVT. So red is good, uh, blue is bad, uh, unstable. So uh, when you make your thickness cobalt ion boron thin uh, with your di junction diameter of 30, then you get a very good performance. But when you make it smaller and smaller, uh, then it becomes bluish and you re your, your uh, barrier evaporates. But of course, uh, as I said, there is something going on here. And there is a scheme in which uh, when you make your uh, thickness thicker uh, with small, keeping the small dimension, basically making your magnet a bar magnet, then you can uh, recover this uh, lost stability uh, with this uh, thin film scheme. So we went ahead and built them. So uh, this is what we, we were seeing before. And uh, with this scheme, uh, we were able to see and show that we can go down to uh, below uh, five nanometers with reasonably high uh, energy barrier. So in other words, non-volatility. Well, um, I, I just want to just briefly mention that the when you compare this junction diameter, I'm, I'm talking about 10 nanometers or 30 nanometers. And these days, uh, these uh, processor people uh, say our, our uh, uh, processor is based on, uh, let's say, uh, seven nan six nanometer technology and so on and so forth. But they're talking about the smallest dimension of the device. And we are talking about the uh, device dimension itself. So when you want to compare, when you compare the, our numbers with theirs, uh, there is a factor of three difference uh, approximately. So uh, when we say 30 nanometer here, uh, which is in, in their language, half pitch 30 nanometer, uh, the gate length is approximately uh, 10 nanometers. So when we, when, when, when we are talking about nine nanometers. So in their language, the gate length is three nanometers. So, which means that we can keep up with this technology 
uh, down to a uh, very small dimension of uh, semiconductor transistors. Okay, so it looks like this. Uh, uh, this is our first report, and uh, this is a, a perpendicular bar magnet uh, with a scale of less than 10 nan 20 nanometers. And uh, this produces uh, the results that I have just shown. And these are uh, uh, energy loss spectroscopy map showing that uh, those elements that, uh, that, uh, that we put into uh, are, are, are there where they're supposed to be. And uh, that performance is uh, like, uh, this is, uh, this shows that we have a reasonably good tonal magnet resistance change. And here in this case, we show that we can switch it by a switching current. And uh, to our surprise, when we published this uh, in Nature Communications, uh, very almost uh, the same time, but uh, we were very fortunate that we were there uh, before, uh, but French group uh, also showed that uh, they can do this, uh, they can do this thing in different material systems. So, uh, uh, you know, we did not talk about this in any conference, but, uh, but uh, the idea uh, was, uh, was universal in a sense. Okay, uh, let me just briefly mention what sort of impact uh, this technology might have uh, for the future in green society or uh, net zero uh, carbon dioxide. So this slide shows uh, basically the scheme how we make our society carbon free uh, or net zero emission. Here we are using a, a large amount of energy, uh, which is non-electrical, -elect and this is electrical. The electric electricity is the only energy that we can produce in uh, without a carbon emission using renewable energy. Uh, so, uh, what uh, needs to be done is to reduce uh, en energy usage and also increase the energy usage, uh, energy that is uh, we are, what we are using in terms of electricity and, uh, and provide those electricity by renewable energy. But in order to do so, well, we need to control many, many, many things uh, and optimize them. And for that, we actually need another uh, electricity. Here's the uh, I hope you can see it, but this is electricity demand of uh, uh, ICT sector. And uh, it, currently we are using uh, approximately two petawatt hour uh, for this uh, ICT sector. But when we, when we don't do anything, uh, that it's projected to increase about eight uh, petawatt hour which is approximately the same amount of energy that we're using uh, for uh, uh, using in uh, uh, electricity. So we have to do something about this. And the idea here is that uh, this is shows uh, what happens if you don't do anything. Uh, we have a large uh, power consumption from network and we also spend a huge amount of power to store the data. And these edge device or the IoT devices produce uh, every second a huge amount of data. So we want to make them uh, smarter so that all the data, we do not need to transport them through network and store them uh, in cloud uh, so, so that we can analyze it. But uh, we make this uh, edge part or IoT part smarter so that we can uh, reduce the amount of uh, data that we transport and uh, reduce some, at the same time, reduce the amount of uh, data that we store in, in the cloud. And for this, we need energy efficient computing and energy efficient computing for sensing and IoT. And that's exactly what I have shown uh, in the previous slide. So in the very last minute, I would like to discuss about what else can you do other than 
just non-volatile memory. Of course, non just non-volatile memory is probably uh, not the, an appropriate way of saying it. Uh, this non-volatile memory, working memory, uh, gives us a huge uh, possibility of reducing uh, carbon emission, for example. But can you do more? And of course, the answer is yes. Uh, otherwise, I will not have this section here. And uh, remember that I told you uh, when E over KBT is less than 20, we have a very unstable magnetic tunnel junction. So a very unstable magnetic tunnel junction like this one. Uh, this is uh, 20 millisecond and there's ups and downs. This is high state, high resistance state. This is low resistance state. And it flips uh, just like uh, this slide. And this gives an idea of how unstable they are. But this uh, stochastic behavior we can use to do, uh, construct a, a new form of computing. In uh, 1981, uh, Richard Feynman uh, gave a talk uh, about simulating physics with computers. And here he discussed about quantum computing. computing. If you want to make a simulation na of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. But after this, he mentioned about the other way to simulate a probabilistic nature, of course, a probabilistic nature is built in, in quantum mecha me mechanics. Uh, probabilistic nature is, is by, by computer, which itself is probabilistic. So what uh, he mentioned about probabilistic computing. And utilizing this uh, unstable magnetic tunnel junction, we can build a probabilistic uh, computer. Uh, here we call it p -bit. Uh, changing the probability of be being at the low state or high state, we can change it by biasing this magnetic tunnel junction. So uh, in the end, we can have this, sorry about this small uh, figure, but this sigmoidal uh, output, which we can use as a uh, stochastic neuron. And I will not go into the details of uh, the algorithm, but uh, um, you know, we can modify an uh, adiabatic quantum computing algorithm, which is used for uh, quantum annealing, to uh, optimize things. In, in our example, we, we took up this integer factorization. Basically, if you, for a given number like 35, and uh, we, we immediately know that it's uh, 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 five by seven, uh, but we can uh, formulate the, the problem in terms of this energy and minimize this energy, which brings uh, us the, the, the answer. And we can build a circuit using this uh, pro, uh, unstable uh, magnetic tunnel junction to give us, uh, in, in terms of energy landscape, the correct answer of X and Y. And this was done here. So this is 35, 7 by 5, uh, 161, uh, and uh, 945. Um, using just eight uh, unstable uh, magnetic tunnel junction. I have to warn you that uh, this will not go on and on because uh, uh, as you can see, we can get a, a rather not terribly sharp landscape. So, uh, well, of course, that depends on uh, what the problem set, but still, it will good for giving you an approximate answer. So integer factorization is probably not uh, a good example in that case, because we will have run into this problem when the integer becomes very large. But there are many other uh, problem set or that people want to optimize. And in those cases, uh, you know, only approximate uh, solution is usually good enough. So uh, we are hoping that uh, we can uh, expand this. Uh, well, there are other advantages uh, pointed out by uh, Superior's group, but basically this is what, uh, what we have shown in uh, our 
not coming soon, sorry. Uh, I, I forgot to replace uh, the latest slide, but uh, it was published in Nature. So uh, quantum annealing machine, we can compare uh, uh, our, our approach and uh, it works at room temperature. It's, we remember that we only used eight P magnetic tunnel junction, but there are technology out there uh, with MRAM, they're talking about uh, gigabit, gigabit integration and uh, they already achieved uh, 100, uh, 200 megabit integration. So uh, uh, it's already manufactured and we can implement many body interactions, which is uh, not uh, quite straightforward in a quantum case, but we do not have quantum supremacy, which means that there are certain limit about which we cannot reach uh, prohibit us to reach, uh, but we don't know the limit yet. And uh, we are hoping that uh, this uh, large number that we can access uh, using the current technology will give us some uh, meaningful space that we can answer those optimization problems that people want to have an approximate answer, answer of. Well, in addition, let me finish my slide by showing, uh, talk by showing a couple of more slides because I think it's uh, in interesting, although I will not go into the details. Well, um, let me, you know, we are working on probabilistic computer using unstable magnetic tunnel junction. So the natural question is how fast we can do this? Or do we know exactly what determines relaxation time? And relaxation time uh, is shown here. And this delta is uh, number 80 or 20 that we discussed. And uh, many people believe that uh, the attempt uh, time constant is approximately one nanosecond. So we went into uh, this, and this was published uh, late uh, this year in uh, PRB. Uh, we went into this uh, question and did some simulations. Uh, using uh, you know, Fokker Planck and uh, LLG in combined. And we sh found out that uh, depending on uh, perpendicular magnetic tunnel junction, which we use, or in plane, uh, the time constants are very different. And depending on uh, the anisotropy, even though keeping this barrier height the same, uh, we can change uh, the, the time constant uh, two orders of magnitude almost. Isn't it interesting? And uh, that's because I will not go into the details because of the landscape, potential landscape that we see in these, uh, in these magnetic tunnel junction. But uh, for the interest of time, I will just skip it. And uh, we wanted to see if this is indeed the case. And uh, this was published uh, in 2021, this year in PR PRL, uh, that Indeed, this in-plane version of a stochastic magnetic tunnel junction gives us a very short time scale of eight nanosecond, as opposed to a uh, millisecond regime that we used to do our demonstration of probabilistic computing. So there are uh, many things that uh, we can understand and further deepen our understanding uh, using this extreme case. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the last slide. Uh, I have talked to you about uh, the history and what sort of things that we have overcome to get the magnetic tunnel junction that we people use today uh, for integrated circuits. And I have shown you that scaling is possible down to very small scale uh, approximately. We recently showed two and a half nanometer magnetic working nano magnetic magnetic tunnel junction by making it uh, a bar, bar magnet. And I also tried to convince you that we can do more by utilizing this uh, unstable uh, magnetic tunnel junction. Okay, so that's uh, all for today. And I'm very happy to answer any question you have. So thank you very much indeed. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ono, for this excellent uh, overview of the latest uh, developments. Uh, so I clap on behalf of everyone.
I'm very delighted to welcome many distinguished uh, guests today, including uh, Professor Albert Furt. He's also here with us oh. in the audience. Okay, uh, uh, before we take the questions, uh, I like to take a group photo. So may I request you to stop your sharing and I request all of us to switch on your video camera and uh, we will take a couple of uh, screenshots. Thank you so much for your kind cooperation. Okay. So, there are many people today, about 120 people. It's really nice. Ah, Professor Wolfram Kliman is here. Nice to see you, Wolfram. Okay. Many people have not switched on the camera, but I respect that. All right. Okay. So I think uh, uh, maybe one more. Albert, we cannot see you. I can Where? see you. I can see you, Albert. Okay. Where is he? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very nice to see you, Albert. Thank you. All right. Ah, oh, Asukmi is also here. Good to see you. Okay, so I request all of you to switch off your camera, then we can uh, take questions. So, Professor Ono, you can kindly uh, share your screen again. And I see some okay. questions uh, uh, by students they start with. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. I have a question to ask in addition to thickness, what other material factors help to determine the stability of a MTJ? Well, uh, apart from thickness, okay. Um... Let's see. Oh, oops. Oh, this is not the one that I wanted to show. Oh, let's see. Uh, well, apart from thickness, well, thickness is important because there is uh, interface perpendicular anisotropy. So in order to see this uh, interface uh, perpendicular anisotropy, we wanted to make it thin. So any system that has interface anisotropy perpendicular to the plane, and make it a thin film, we can see this perpendicular easy axis. So uh, the key is the interface, and uh, that's how we achieved uh, this uh, you know, perpendicular easy axis magnetic tunnel junction. Yeah, I mean, I have actually follow up question uh, somehow due to time constant to skip that slide. So if you could kindly share your PPT and uh, go to that slide on the interface cell anisotropy, it would be nice. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see if I can uh, get it to work. Yeah, something. Okay. Is yes. So, All right. So um, let me see. Here. Yeah, I think here. This yeah. one. Yes. So I iron uh, doesn't have a strong crystalline anisotropy. To start with, but it has uh, you know a, a number of d uh, you know orbitals, and uh, we by bonding this the, one of these these uh, d orbitals with oxygen, which is coming from magnesium oxide, we make this uh, d orbitals basically uh, any higher in terms of energy, so taking it out from the landscape of compensating uh, crystalline anisotropy. And it happens uh, that this bonding here uh, gives uh, or this, this uh, iron orbital that bonds to oxygen in 001 plane uh, it, it, it was, is contributing to the in-plane crystalline anisotropy. And we lifted it basically making the, uh, the contribution of this, in, uh, uh, this orbitals in plane anisot crystalline anisotropy less. And that's how we get total perpendicular anisotropy at the interface of iron and MGO. So that's, uh, that's the explanation I wanted to 
uh, give you using this slide. Yes, uh, and uh, just a follow up question like, uh, it, the interfacial anisotropy will be there all the time. Yeah? It doesn't really depend on the thickness of uh, either cobalt iron bone or non-NGO or? Correct. Um, uh, well, well, we are assuming that uh, we are having a crystalline uh, iron MGO structure, but uh, yes, indeed, uh, it doesn't depend on the thickness. Uh, interface uh, is there and uh, this, this uh, slide here, this volume depends on the thickness, but uh, this interface or cross-section area doesn't depend on the thickness. So this is, this is constant if you keep the size of your device constant, but uh, we, you can reduce this part by making your cobalt ion boron thin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if there are questions, uh, kindly raise hand. Okay, uh, Braj, please uh, unmute and ask. Uh, nice talk, Onam. So uh, my question is regarding because we are uh, reducing the size of magnetic tunnel junction. What about if we go to the molecular tunnel junction, where single molecule work as a tunnel barrier? All well, I want. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, direction. Uh, well, we can make it very small, like uh, two and a half nanometers. And uh, we are making it into a, a non volatile memory. But uh, the, the other physics question I, I, we can ask ourselves is that how small we can we need to go in order to see a macroscopic quantum tunneling from this structure? And uh, maybe we cannot go using this material set, we might not be able to go down to molecular level because we lose all the magnetism there. But uh, even, even these systems, uh, we, have, uh, we, we can ask ourselves an interesting physics question of macroscopic quantum tunneling. Okay. okay. Did I answer your question? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank okay. Uh, thanks, Braj, for your answer. I'm sorry, I was on, not on mute. Uh, Sobik, please unmute and ask. Uh, yeah, thank you for this excellent talk. So maybe this is a question from a relative outsider to the field. So I was wondering, I mean, as you showed this uh, symmetry filtering effect of MGO. So is there any uh, uh, you know, effort in the field to develop other kinds of barrier material and to understand uh, how one can optimize the filtering effect? Or do you think this is kind of almost all done, we have found the best material there. Well, um, well, the answer is that uh, we are, or not we, but uh, many others are looking into uh, alternative uh, materials. Well, the reason is that uh, we want to make, make sure that, uh, let me go back to uh, the slide. Um, oh, no, no. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. Um, so, so the well, the unanswered uh, thing or what people are exploring is that uh, we want to make this uh, resistance actually uh, rather small, uh, this tunnel resistance. And in order to do so, we have to reduce the magnesium oxide thickness. So if magnesium oxide thickness is very thin, then we lose this filtering effect. So the magic is all gone and uh, we cannot get high tunnel magnetic resistance. So the alternative approach is to make the barrier height uh, in, in magnesium oxide low or in insulator low, but still keeping this uh, tunneling effect. So basically making this uh, uh, layer thick and decay rate uh, slow. So uh, in that case, we can uh, uh, enjoy this uh, filtering effect and also low resistance. But uh, that's something that the people haven't found yet. Magnesium oxide, for some reason, uh, works currently uh, best. And the easy approach, for example, is that we tried was to uh, bring 
zinc uh, here. So magnesium zinc oxide, that's an easy sort of, uh, you know, to reduce uh, band gap. But uh, I think, you know, we haven't found out the way in which we can get the same result as magnesium oxide without zinc. So uh, there, there are many possibilities, I believe, uh, and many researchers and research groups are working on it. But uh, so far, I think the best combination yet is uh, cobalt ion boron MGO. Okay, okay, great. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, there are some questions uh, from uh, audience. I can read it. I'm sorry, I, I copy pasted some wrong messages which I wanted to write to my group. Like there will be a power cut next week, so please ignore uh, that. Uh, so, uh, by Sridham, thank you for the nice talk. You have mentioned that crystalline MGO is deposited on amorphous CFP. Can you explain this? How amorphous CFP promotes MGO zero zero one? Well, that's the uh, nature of MGO, I must say. So it was found uh, some years ago uh, that uh, on amorphous uh, silicon nitride in that case, uh, when you deposit MGO, uh, the MGO uh, organized itself in very highly oriented way, uh, which turned out to be the MGO uh, 001 direction, which is the direction that we want it to be. So this is uh, nature just arrange things uh, in such a way. Uh, I think nobody yet understands the dynamics of why MGO uh, wanted to assemble itself uh, in that way. But there is uh, another research question here, is that uh, we uh, observed that we need to uh, deposit, well, at least three monolayers of MGO to start seeing this, before which uh, MGO itself is amorphous. So there is, there is some mechanism that triggers uh, MGO into crystalline, highly oriented crystal. And uh, nobody understands this yet. So that's another interesting dynamics, how, uh, why, and how, and how thin MGO can become uh, to make, make itself uh, highly 001 oriented. Did I answer the question? Yeah, I think... Uh... So thank you so much. There is another question by Chandrasekhar Murapatta. Thank you for the wonderful talk. How about the critical current density for switching in few nanometer diameter MTJ? The current density is proportional to the uh, thickness uh, of or the, uh, the MST. Yeah. So that's basically this question. Well, so far, well, that's that's also a very critical question. I I I I I I, I must say, um, the. The very the simplest model of uh, crit critical thick, uh, current is that critical current is proportional to the stability or delta or energy barrier. And energy barrier, we want to keep it uh, greater than KBT, much greater than KBT, which means that the switching current uh, doesn't scale with the size. So uh, when you make the device smaller and smaller, uh, the, the required current density increases. And that's what we are seeing today. And, but uh, because uh, we are using a rather thick, uh, in terms of those uh, small junctions, we, we, we make it thick so that we can uh, have a, a space in which we can change the materials system or we can change uh, other things. And the, so th there is space that we can play with. And the most important factor, I believe, is to reduce the damping. So uh, the switching current is proportional to damping times uh, energy barrier. And uh, what we are seeing down to, let's say, less than five nanometers is basically our understanding of that, or using that simple picture applies uh, for those small uh, use, use uh, materials that can give us a small damping. Uh, but that's a, a very good question. And uh, the, the switching current doesn't scale with the size. So that's uh, one of the limiting factors in the future. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, I do not see more questions. I have to make a few announcements. Uh, next week, uh, there will be no WPS seminar because next week, Thursday, is the Diwali Festival. That's the festival of light in India. So I congratulate all of you and best wishes. Uh, um, maybe I request for Sohono uh, to uh, stop sharing. Okay. I'd like to share my screen and show you something. And the week after, we will have uh, the talk by Professor Supriyo Dutta from US. Uh, Professor Ono mentioned about it. And uh, I'd like to mention that we are organizing a symposium on magnetism and spintronics. So it will also have topics on magnetism and uh, spintronics. It will be 25th to 27th November. I encourage uh, colleagues to uh, participate in this uh, conference. Now, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ono, for your excellent and wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm sure if there are more questions, uh, uh, people can write you and uh, you can answer. And uh, we are welcoming you also in other seminars. Uh, so see if you can attend. Uh, so on behalf of our team, uh, I'd like to present you a small digital plaque. I will read it for you. Uh, w 2 seminar webinar series on spintronics. National Institute of Science, Education and Research, NYSER, Bhubaneswar, India. Takes pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Hideo Ono, Tokyo University, Sendai, Japan. Uh, in recognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on magnetic tunnel junction from non-volatile memory to probabilistic computing. So thank you so very much again for your excellent overview and excellent lecture. And thank you all of you for kindly joining this lecture. We had a overwhelming uh, audience, uh, more than 125 people and I am um, from all over the places. And I, I really thank all of you for joining. See you the uh, Thursday after next week. Uh, so that will be, I think, uh, uh, I think 11th uh, November. So until that, uh, please uh, stay safe and uh, see you next time. Thank you so much, all of you. Take care. Oh, thank you very uh, much. Bye-bye. Thank you.